Okay, welcome to today's uh, distinguished lecture uh, by Thorsten Holtz. He'll talk about, as you see, fuzz testing and beyond. Uh, we have uh, in the past years uh, had many um, points of contact with Thorsten. He's professor at the uh, University in Bochum, a well known center for research and security. He focuses, as most of you uh, know, on system security and um, you always see Thorsten and Thorsten's uh, group published at the top conferences um, interesting papers and in the last uh, periods uh, with a focus on, on, on testing. So we're very happy to have you here, Thorsten, um, and we all look forward to your talk. Yeah, thanks a lot, Edgar, for this nice introduction. And yeah, I'm happy to, to be here today. So unfortunately not physically because uh, a trip to Vienna is always nice. Uh, actually, I spent uh, about nine months as a postdoc at TU Vienna. So I have uh, really loved the city and everything. So I hope once the pandemic is over, we will have another chance to visit Vienna. And actually also my kids want to go to Vienna for all the horses and everything. So they are big fans of horses. Okay, um, today's talk uh, is about fast testing. I wanna provide an overview of some of the recent um, yeah, research results and the papers we have presented in this area. And I also wanna provide a general overview of uh, what fast testing is all about. And in case you have questions, either uh, send a chat message or just speak up. So this doesn't have to be a monologue for one hour. So just uh, interrupt me whenever something is unclear. As Edgar said, I'm a professor at Ruhr University Bochum. Um, I'm in Bochum since about 11 years now, and I'm, I'm heading the chair for system security. And I have about a dozen PhD students and uh, two postdocs at the moment. And that's a crew picture actually from, I think about two years ago. And all of the work I'm talking about today is based on this nice uh, collaboration. So I have several great PhD students and postdocs. And um, in this talk, especially the work from Cornelius Aschermann and Sergei Shumilo is relevant, but also many other PhD students are involved. So there's actually a team effort. And especially in the past few years, we spent quite a lot of time in um, this area. You can find an overview of what we do at uh, susec.rub.de, where you find also a copy of all of our papers. And on GitHub, we have most of the projects we did uh, in source code. So in case you want to build upon our work or want to extend it or try to replicate it, feel free to reach out and we're happy to provide access to the code. And as I said, the papers are available online. This is a, yeah, a short summary of what we've uh, published recently. As Edgar said, we are quite active in that space. And as you see, uh, one of the main topics or main uh, words we have used recently is actually fuzzing. So in the past, as I said, about 10 years, we first started with a lot of network security work. Then we switched a bit to binary analysis. And especially in the past two or three years, we had uh, quite a lot of uh, work in the area of fuzzing. So, and this is what today's talk is about. So I wanna provide a general introduction in the first part and then talk about some of the research results we have published in the past few months and past few years actually. Mm -hmm. So first, uh, a general overview. Uh, fuzzing um, is an artificial word combining um, or describing a me mechanism to test a given system. So the system here on the right, this can be either a program, so some kind of user space program, like a word, like a word processor, a web browser, a JavaScript engine, or some other program that runs in user space. The system that we want to test can also be an operating system kernel, something like Linux or Windows. It can be a hypervisor, it can be uh, something even deeper in the software stack, or it could also be uh, something like an embedded system. So some kind of system that we want to test. So on the right hand here, we have the system under test, which we want to analyze for potential vulnerabilities. 
We then also have a certain input that we can send to the system under test. So let's imagine we have a command line utility that we want to test. Then we would send an input to this program and just observe how the program is reacting. So we send it from the command line to the program and then basically see whether the program crashes by chance. For other types of system, the input would uh, look a bit different. Let's say we have a web server that we want to test, then we would send an HTTP request to the system. If it's an SSL library, we would uh, send some kind of message that triggers, for example, a key establishment um, process. If it's an embedded system, we could use one of the different interfaces and send some kind of input to the system that we want to test. And the basic idea of fuzzing is that we do this um, input or we provide this input to the system and then observe what's happening. Of course, in a typical setting, nothing interesting will happen. So the system will not crash, but it will somehow process the input that we send to the system. But then here, the trick is that we introduce some kind of randomness. So we basically mutate the message that we'd send to the system. For example, we could induce some kind of bit flip. So we turn a zero into one or one into zero, and then send a mutated message again to the system that we want to test. We could also perform other kinds of mutations. For example, we could add some random input at the end of the uh, whole message. We could cut out some uh, of the input in the middle. We could um, reformat the message and then we have some other rules. So basically we have some several mutation strategies in order to mutate the input that we send to the system. Still, this sounds that this is not really that effective. So you basically send random inputs to a program and expect that you find something interesting. Hmm, this sounds a bit naive at the beginning. And so the surprising idea is that this actually works pretty well in practice. And this especially works because we can do this in parallel we can do this on a massive scale. And you can think of this as this horde of monkeys that have typewriters. And eventually, one of the typewriters will write a Shakespeare uh, text. So basically, by doing this many, many times and with clever mutations, we can eventually find interesting uh, inputs that will actually lead to a crash. And then we have found some kind of security vulnerability. If we teach this to our students, uh, they also uh, love this basic idea. We had some students in the past that basically then just took some fuzzers, applied them to some software tools, um, and found interesting types of crashes in, in even yeah, some very relevant types of programs. So in practice, this uh, simple idea actually works. And I'll explain a bit more why this works so effectively in practice. The basic idea is rather old. So if you take a look uh, back in the 60s, 70s, people uh, used uh, even punch, ca uh, punch cards with random uh, programs and used this random inputs to test the system. And then this uh, term fuzzing was coined by Miller in a paper. Actually, that was a first a semester project that he gave to his students because he observed that by randomly sending input to a command line utility, he was able to induce crashes. So as a term project for his students, he gave them the task to do this in a more systematic way. And then eventually this term fuzzing uh, came up. And especially in the past few years, this whole area has received quite a lot of attention. So if you take a look at the major security and also software engineering conferences, you will see that there's quite an active um, group of people working in this space. I already talked about uh, or a bit about the uh, efficiency or why this works. And this was also one of the lessons learned. So uh, back in 2016, 2017, Robert, one of my PhD students back then, um, he had finished a project on code reuse uh, attacks. So this was back when we did lots of uh, software exploitation research. And then we were brainstorming about the next uh, project we wanted to work on. And back then, uh, Robert proposed to uh, work on fuzzing because he's, he was into software security and finding vulnerabilities. And uh, fuzzing was actually well explored. 
So at least this was my understanding back then. So we had uh, some discussions, but then at the end we agreed that fuzzing is probably not a good topic to work on, given that Microsoft and other companies had already invested uh, quite a lot of effort into this area. And then also uh, many papers were published and my group and also many other PhD students were working more on, let's say the proper CS approaches to testing. Like uh, we basically um, lift the binary to an intermediate language, then perform some analysis, maybe via an SMT solver. So we generate some formulas and then ask the solver whether these formulas are satisfiable or not. So we basically build all these textbook tools how you would use taint analysis, symbolic execution, and all of this. They worked well in practice, but then, and we also found bugs. But then Robert still uh, wanted to continue to work or to explore fuzzing. And then the lesson learned is that with probably less effort and by then using more clever mutation strategies or building this in an efficient way, you can actually find way more vulnerabilities and the, the lesson learned is a bit that sometimes this textbook thing and also the advice that you get from your PhD advisor is something you should not follow. Because nowadays I have four or five PhD students just working on fuzzing. And yeah, back then I should have listened to my PhD student that we would have started this whole area earlier. So lesson learned, uh, also professors are wrong at some point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Coming back to why fuzzing works, uh, one of the things is efficiency. Because imagine that you can send 50 inputs to the system that you want to test. And then if you do a bit math, you see that you can do more than 4 million different kinds of inputs per day. If you do the implementation in a clever way, you can do much more than 50 executions per second. So you can, with some tuning, do this uh, thousands or tens of thousands executions per second. And then, as I said, this army of monkeys will eventually write Shakespeare. And in the same way, you will eventually find interesting inputs that will lead to a crash. And with the tools we have developed, we found hundreds of crashes in many uh, widely used software systems, or Google is doing this uh, whole thing on a much larger scale. They have with OSS FASA whole infrastructure where they test about 300 open source systems and they found more than 20,000 crashes via this um, setup. So fuzzing is at the moment probably the most effective mechanism in practice to find security vulnerabilities. And in the following, I want to provide an overview of why this works because uh, there were some clever ideas that were developed in the past few years in order to make this much more efficient, because the main idea is that we need to define a clever goal function. And then basically we define a goal that we want to maximize. And then the fuzzer um, has basically a goal that he wants to work towards. And because he can do this many million times, he will eventually find a way how to basically achieve the goal that you uh, want to achieve. And the uh, easiest way how to do this is so-called coverage-guided fuzzing. That's a basic idea that was proposed in a tool called AFL um, that's, that was developed by an engineer at Google. And coverage-guided fuzzing actually led to quite a lot of uh, additional research in that space. And the basic idea is as follows. Again, we have in the middle the system that we want to test. What we also have is uh, some kind of source code representation of the system. So let's say you have a command line utility, then you would have a binary and the binary is basically shown on the right hand side. So basically some kind of call graph or some other kind of representation of the program that you want to test. For a kernel, this would be similar. So you have in the kernel in binary format and you also have a code representation to a certain extent. The same concept also applies for an embedded system or any other type of system that you want to test. And of course, you also have the input that you can send to the system. What you now need is some kind of way to observe the system that you want to test. This can be done, for example, as a compiler extension that basically during the compilation stage, 
you add some instrumentation to the system such that you can, can observe what code blocks are actually executed such that you basically use, yeah, obtain some kind of trace of what happened. Or it can be um, some kind of dynamic binary instrumentation that you do the instrumentation at runtime, or you could think of other ways how to basically observe what the program is doing at the moment. This could also be a side channel or some other way how to observe what's actually happening with the system that you are testing. And then we follow the same approach that we uh, that I explained earlier. So we take the input, perform some kind of mutation by flipping bits or adding some um, message paths to it. And then this mutated input is sent to the system that we want to test. And then we observe what code regions are actually executed. So these are now colored in green. So by sending the input at the bottom of the slide to the system, we are executing these green regions. So this input is interesting for us because it provides us with an information how to cover this part of the code. And coverage guided fuzzing uh, has the goal of maximizing the code coverage. So we want to mutate the inputs such that we maximize the code coverage with the intent that when we are able to reach a specific part deep in, uh, inside the program, we already have an input that passes all the conditions to get there. And then we have also a pretty high chance to actually find a vulnerability in that part of the code in case there's something. Okay, so we have this one input and then we do the same thing. So we take our input, mutate it, send it to the system again. But the second input now uh, executes the exact same sequence. So again, colored in green. So therefore the second input is not helpful for us because we already have the first input that executes this code region. So therefore we can throw away the second mutated input because it doesn't provide us any new information, any kind of new knowledge because we have already achieved the coverage via the uh, input on the bottom. In a third step, we again perform a random mutation. Send this mutated input to the system under test. And then we see suddenly we uh, execute another region, maybe another if um, clause was taken. So basically we have a, another region executed. So this um, third input is then interesting for us because it helps us to uh, cover an additional part of the program. And now the combination of the uh, input at the top and at the bottom of the slide already provides us with everything colored in orange. So we can already cover quite a lot of the whole code. And by doing this in an iterative way, so we again mutate these inputs and then to the system, observe what we are covering, we can over time maximize code coverage or branches taken or some other metric that we basically give the fuzzer to optimize. AFL and other fuzzers uh, use a bitmap to have a, a compact representation of what edges of the binary are already taken. So instead of having a complex uh, data structure that keeps track of uh, all the branches in the program and then marking which branches are taken in which order, we have a, a compact representation that basically only tells us if a specific branch has ever been taken. So basically we're losing some information but therefore the bitmap is a very compact representation of the uh, branches we have seen so far. But note that the bitmap is, as I said, some kind of abstraction. So uh, basically from an entry in the bitmap, we do not know what branch this was exactly, but it's basically just a compressed version. And we're coming back to this later because that was one of the papers we uh, worked on. Mm -hmm. And then what we, or the open challenges in that space are then how to basically reach deep parts of the code or um, many uh, real world programs use some kind of code constructs that are hard to overcome. Maybe they use some kind of checksum or they uh, expect some kind of pre um, formatted input. And then of course, if you send random input to your program, it's pretty hard to basically get complex conditions. And this is where many papers and many research groups are focusing on. So how can we actually find 
interesting inputs that yeah, lead us to interesting regions within the program and can then detect security vulnerabilities. So, fuzzing challenges. Um, I'm, I want to start with one of the earlier papers we did in that space because this was one of our starting points where we took a look at uh, the existing state of the artworks and then we um, checked what kind of code constructs are hard for them to solve. And trivial examples that we found where the fuzzer was not able to actually detect the vulnerability are here in, in a bit abstracted way shown on the slide. The first part is a, a magic number example. So you can think of this as, let's say you have a parser that takes as input um, a specific file and then first checks whether the first few bytes uh, match a specific um, magic number. And this magic number specifies that this is a file of a specific type. So, and then you can imagine if, let's say, the input uh, is expected to start with this magic header uh, string, then of course, if you just send random inputs to the program, your chance that you exactly guess this string is almost zero. Because if you just flip bits or if you just add something to your message, then the chance that you uh, generate, especially this string, is rather small. Another example that we found uh, occurring in the wild quite often are checksums. And checksums can also be nested. So here on the slide, you see uh, one example. If you take a look at this, you will eventually figure out how the input will look like. But even if you take a look at this uh, for 30 seconds, it's probably not that easy to see how the input needs to be structured. And then imagine you need to basically just send random inputs to this uh, checksum computation function. The uh, chance that you um, generate an input that passes all three if checks is rather small. So reaching this bug two is actually yeah, almost negligible because you would need to generate uh, specifically this input string. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, one of the first papers we worked on was called Red Queen, where the basic idea is that we wanted to build something or a, a fuzzing framework that is capable of solving some of these challenges without relying on complex um, program analysis techniques like taint analysis or symbolic execution. Because those techniques are nice. So um, there are wonderful tools like CLI or other frameworks for symbolic execution and others for taint analysis. But typically, they do not require well to complex programs. So symbolically executing a browser is something that's infeasible in practice at the moment. Similarly, also taint analysis for complex code constructs, let's say floating point instructions or some other uh, yeah, or bigger programs uh, leads to state explosion and uh, imprecise tainting. So uh, this, these techniques work well on medium-sized programs, but then if you take uh, complex programs and if you only have binary code as input, then it's pretty hard to use these textbook techniques in practice. So therefore, with Red Queen, the goal was on the one hand to develop a framework for binary fuzzing. So we do not assume that we have access to the source code, so we cannot do any compile time instrumentation, but basically just have the binary. And we do not want to use uh, complex um, program analysis techniques. And then the um, idea or the main insight here is that uh, in practice, we often have something what we call an input to state correspondence. So you send a specific input to the system that we want to test. And in this input, there are some values and here with one value shown on the slide. And this value is then used internally by the uh, system in order to um, determine whether a specific state was reached or whether a specific uh, condition holds or something like that. So the, the value is somehow corresponding to the internal state of the program that we want to test. In the example that we see here, um, we basically have the value that is sent as part of the input to the system. And then via our in instrumentation, we see the value being used in uh, or during the execution of the program. So basically what we do is 
we observe um, instructions like compares or others, where basically the input is compared to specific um, other values. And here during one of the compares, we would see that the value that we sent in the initial stage to the system is then actually also um, used um, during execution. So as part of a comparison. Of course, this uh, often does not work in practice that easily because typically programmers perform some kind of encoding. So they do some kind of processing on the input. They turn it to, um, to um, upper case letters or they uh, perform some other kind of encoding. And therefore, typically you do not have an, a one-to-one -one mapping between the value we send as an input and the value we see as part of a compare. But that's the nice thing about fuzzing. You do not need to be fully precise, but you can basically use brute force. So then you send just many, many types of encoded values. And in practice, we saw that programmers actually uh, typically use only a limited number of encoding and pre-processing steps. And by just sending 10 times uh, the number of inputs, eventually we will hit an encoding that is then actually used in practice. And coming back to this um, problem I talked about earlier, where the magic header is, um, there was a compare of a magic header with the input, we would see that we send a value to the system that we want to test. We see what string the program is comparing against. We see this magic header as a string. And then we see there's a mismatch between the input that we sent, which was just random input, and then this fixed string that we uh, observe during runtime. And then we can also use this fixed string, transfer this to our input. And then in the next mutation, we basically send the string that we saw during runtime and send this value to the program. And then of course um, there can be some um, processing happening, but then we will eventually figure out how this string compare actually looks like. And then we have bypassed this problem. In a similar way, uh, we can also um, bypass uh, checksums, even nested ones. There, of course, we need to do this in a bit more clever way. But at the end, this actually works well in practice. And Red Queen was then able to solve um, the challenges that I explained on the previous slide. Um, the paper is available on the website. And uh, on GitHub, you will also find the source code. And there I also want to briefly talk about all this engineering uh, that's, that happened, because um, this is actually part of a bigger project uh, where Cornelius and also Sergey did their PhD thesis on. So this is not a single paper, but basically a series of paper where we um, also build upon prior work. And the starting point was a tool called KAFL that we published at USENIX Security 2017. You can think of KFL as a custom hypervisor that is yeah, customized for fuzzing purposes. So basically we have a thin layer. That's basically what you see here as a, an abstraction on the computing stack where we basically have the bare metal. So that's the CPU at the bottom. And there we use um, an Intel processor and we uh, rely on Intel PT. That's uh, a, a abbreviation for processor trace that's a hardware extension or an ISA extension to be more precise for Intel processors, such that the processor can output a trace of the code that's being executed. So you can think of this as a, you get an event whenever a branch from one uh, point in the code to another uh, part of the code happened, such that you the processor tells you which code was executed and which jumps were taken. Given that this is implemented uh, in hardware, it's rather efficient. And um, Cornelius and Sergey also spent quite a lot of time to optimize uh, this. So they also have an Intel PT decoder and uh, other tricks in order to get exactly this information that we need for fuzzing. And that's uh, also available on GitHub such that um, yeah, Intel PT can be used as a very fast mechanism to uh, provide feedback about which branches were taken by a given program. KFL, as I said, is implemented as some kind of hypervisor. And then within the hypervisor, we can then uh, boot virtual machines. And here on the slide, we see three virtual machines. 
And uh, KFL was uh, basically the first step where we tried to uh, test operating system kernels for potential vulnerabilities. So the basic idea is uh, we boot up the system uh, and within KFL, we then boot a virtual machine. The virtual machine um, then boots a Linux or Windows kernel. And in user space, we only have a very small stuff that's almost generic that basically only helps us to have a communication interface. And then we perform fast testing of the kernel. And we found actually quite a few vulnerabilities in Linux, Windows, and also Mac OS. And that was then the starting point. And the source code of KFL is also available on GitHub. Red Queen was then an extension where we basically use this um, input to state correspondence. And it's basically, you can th also think of this as a lightweight coloring scheme that tries to approximate taint analysis. And um, the combination um, of these two techniques is then described in this um, NDSS paper that we published in 2019. And then if you if you're a computer scientist, you know that adding a layer of abstraction and indirection always helps. So once you have all this tooling available, you can, of course, in your hypervisor, boot another hypervisor. And so the typical CS trick, just add a layer of indirection. And this is what we did with Hypercube. At least to a certain extent, I'll explain this in a bit more detail on the next slide. So uh, there the goal was um, not to test operating system kernels, but to test uh, hypervisor implementations themselves. So we have our own infrastructure that helps us to basically do fuzzing in a rather generic way. And within our hypervisor, we can then boot another hypervisor that we want to test. And in this nested hypervisor, we then boot an operating system. And then this operating system talks to the uh, hypervisor on the lower level, and then we can stress test the hypervisor that we have in the nest configuration. And this is uh, Hypercube, and that's a paper we published uh, in 2020 at NDSS. Mm -hmm. On a bit more abstract level, and not with this uh, stack um, lay layout that I showed on the previous slide, uh, Hypercube works as follows. So we have the host, and the host is basically just a, yeah, a physical machine. Then um, we have the hypervisor, which is basically KFL with several custom uh, modifications. And then we have the virtual machine. That's basically the hypervisor that we want to test. And in there, we boot a Hypercube OS. So that's a small uh, operating system that we implemented. Um, that's also customized for fuzzing. And you see that there's actually quite a lot of engineering going on if we build our own operating system and then um, our own interpreter, our own uh, decompiler. So um, Sergey actually, it was an insane amount of engineering I thought with uh, ranging from low level details. So interacting with Intel PT up to building an operating system and an interpreter. So this is basically full stack development that uh, Sergey and Cornelius it there. To be fair, um, Hypercube OS or this whole uh, Hypercube is um, a bit cheating in the sense that we do not use this uh, coverage guided fuzzing I talked about earlier, but uh, the type of fuzzing we use here is very simple. So what we basically do is we uh, randomly um, yeah, interact with all the interfaces. And here on the slide, you see the typical interfaces that an operating system is interacting with. And all these interfaces need to be somehow emulated or at least somehow be supported by a hypervisor. So we have uh, PCI devices, we have ISA devices, we have things like model specific register or hypercalls or some instructions need to be emulated. And we have things like power management or the chipset and other things at the core. And so there are many, many uh, types of interfaces that the hypervisor needs to support. And what we do here within Hypercube OS and also within Tessa Act is basically generating a long sequence of interactions with these devices. So for example, we perform some interaction with a PCI device and interact with it via DMA or we send some messages to an ISA device 
or we perform some hypercalls with random parameters. And then we do not only one or two of these interactions, but we do a few million of them. And then um, basically we hope that one of those um, millions of interactions we do with the interfaces leads to a crash. So we do not have um, any kind of feedback, so no, no kind of guidance, but this is really a dumb fuzzer, similar like the one I explained on my second slide, that we basically just randomly do stuff but then in practice, this actually works quite well. So this is um, one of the results slides we uh, also have in the paper where we tested um, hypervisors ranging from QEMU, VirtualBox, VMware Fusion, uh, up to Acorn. That's a custom hypervisor implemented by Intel because we have a, a larger projects, a project together with Intel. And you see that in each of them, we found uh, specific types of vulnerabilities um, many of them were also rated uh, as security critical, so they got a CVE entry. And by just this kind of, uh, I would say, dump fuzzing, where we just randomly interact with the interfaces, we still find tens of bugs in complex um, hypervisors. In a follow up paper that we will publish at USNIC Security this year, we uh, present NUX. And NUX is then, I would say, the proper way how to build a modern fuzzer. So we basically take a similar setup, as I explained earlier. But then we also use coverage-guided feedback. So the hypervisor is, or the fuzzer is then not randomly testing interfaces, but the fuzzer uses some goal function to maximize code coverage. And then it turns out that by doing many clever tricks um, and many implementation um, quirks, you get a hypervisor that is very generic. And there we also found many new types of bugs in different kinds of hypervisors. And Nux is probably a very good infrastructure that you want to, or that you could use in order to build your own uh, fuzzers. Although the caveat is that uh, Nux is pretty hard to set up and maintain. So getting a Nux installation up and running in a day is actually already a complex task. Mm -hmm. Okay, so far for um, Red Queen, Hypercube, and uh, the work we did in that space. And then I want to talk in the next few minutes um, about uh, one specific um, project that uh, actually that's probably the best demo that we ever did. So, but I'll show this in a few minutes. Um, because when we um, discuss our work with uh, industry, uh, one of the challenges that they told us that they see in practice is that um, existing fuzzers are typically very good at uh, testing specific type of programs. But once the programs use complex state machines, then existing tools are not really uh, performing that well. Because as I said earlier, uh, AFL and also other fuzzers they use a bitmap to abstract away what branches were taken. So I do not keep a full trace of all the branches and the order of branches because this would uh, be way too slow. Then I cannot do my hundreds of executions per second, but all the state keeping would be very expensive. So therefore they basically only set bitmap entries when a branch from A to B was uh, performed. And they also, um, in a coarse way, also uh, keep track of how often the branch from A to B was taken. So they have a bin that is basically incremented depending on how often the uh, branch was taken. But still, the bitmap is only an abstract representation. So two bitmap entries next, next to each other do not mean that those two branches are somehow related to each other. And you also do not have any information of the order in which the branches were taken. And so therefore the fuzzer doesn't have a really good notion of what is actually a state, what is a state machine, and what input do I need to send to a system to get it into a specific state, and what input needs to then be sent next to gain, get to the next state. And then what we then explored is, can we somehow help the fuzzer? So can we somehow provide the fuzzer some kind of guidance and a guidance for the fuzzer is that we somehow provide a reward for him by adding entries in the bitmap. 
So basically the idea that we um, have explored is, can we somehow have some kind of instrumentation or some kind of annotation such that a human um, can help the fuzzer in order to learn or to basically somehow get a reward for performing specific types of mutations. Because it turns out that we as a human, we are pretty good at spotting a state machine by basically exploring the, uh, the source code, we would see, okay, here is some kind of uh, jump table or something like that. Or in another part of the program, we would see that specific states are followed um, next to each other or something like that. So what we explored here was, can we somehow have a human in the loop approach where an analyst, so this could be someone like a pen tester, basically has a, a kind of um, annotation mechanism where he can guide the fuzzer to produce specific inputs or to produce specific type of mutations. And this is what we call EJON, and I quickly want to show how this looks like. Mm -hmm. um, one of the challenges uh, we had was uh, libtpms, which is a software implementation of a, a TPM, so a trusted platform module. Um, actually has a quite complex state machine because you need to send a sequence of messages to bring the TPM into a specific state and only then you can do interesting things. And if you perform fast testing of lib TPMS with AFL, you see that it um, detects some states, but actually not too many and especially um, complex states. So where you need to send a specific sequence of events is something uh, AFL can not find even after fuzzing for several days. Then with our annotations, um, the picture changes a bit. So what we do here is um, we um, have a small annotation and in the paper, we describe a set of about 10 different instrumentations. And you can think of an instrumentation as something like a small primitive that basically tells the fuzzer, okay, if you reach this state, we set a specific uh, um, entry in the bitmap. And this is then some kind of reward for the fuzzer that basically more bitmap entries are created. So the fuzzer then tries to optimize towards this direction. Or you could also have other annotations that um, basically um, tell the fuzzer, okay, try to maximize a specific value in this, or the, try to maximize this value, try to minimize this value, try to bring this value to specific, um, um, state or something like that. So these annotations are typically only a few lines of code, some like three, four lines of code, and that a human can basically add in order to guide the fuzzer into which direction it should optimize. And this works in practice. And in order to visualize this, um, I think it was Cornelius, but I'm not really sure who it was, had actually created idea because um, fuzzing is typically something you do not really see. That's we perform some mutations, send it to a system, and then we are happy if something crashes. But in all the other millions of, um, of executions, nothing interesting happens. So the typical thing that in security, we work with abstract uh, things. We are happy if a calculator pops up, but we do not have these nice demos. But then um, we had the idea of, can we somehow visualize uh, fuzzing? And then um, here, Super Mario, probably many of you know the game, because in a certain way, you can think of Mario as the prime example of what we want to do. Because what um, Mario or Super Mario uh, is, basically what we have is we need to generate an input sequence to bring Mario, so the character, to the end of the level. We need to uh, basically generate a, a long sequence of inputs to basically guide Mario from the start of the level to the end of the level. There are enemies, there are other things that can um, kill Mario. So what we need to do is we uh, yeah, need to generate the sequence, but we also have some kind of feedback because the feedback is if Mario dies because he is hit by a, um, a cannon or something, then the level is restarted. And um, you, um, this is also uh, very stateful because you can think of the game logic that the game logic is nothing more like a small loop that basically processes the input. And then the, uh, the level advances from the left to the right 
So on the code coverage level, you have uh, quickly explored the whole code coverage because the code coverage is basically just a small uh, game part that is processing the input. And here the challenge is to have a stateful input sequence such, such that Mario is starting at the beginning and reaches the end of the level. What we did here for the demo is uh, to have um, an interface between the game and the fuzzer. The fuzzer then generates inputs and the feedback loop is basically that the fuzzer knows where in the level is Mario or better said basically that Mario advances and as an additional penalty um, if Mario does not advance for a, a small amount of time then we also kill the character such that basically the fuzzer is also re rewarded for bringing Mario closer to the um, end of the level. And then if you basically combine the fuzzer with the game, let this run for a few minutes, you get an input like this. So we have not encoded any notion of what an enemy looks like, how a jump works or something like that, but this is something that the fuzzer has figured out in itself. You see that it kills some of the enemies, not all of them. And even some nice moves are done, and especially here, the end is something I find interesting that basically it also figures out that there are specific jumps. So the jump also doesn't uh, or must not be too long because else it would basically also be killed. And as I said, this is without encoding any notion of what an enemy looks like, um, the fuzzer figures this out over time. Here you see um, yeah, a visualization of the different runs. You see that over time, um, the fuzzer figures out that it needs to jump and jumping further actually um, brings um, the, the game closer to the end. So it figures out that this uh, helps. You see also that sometimes um, it, uh, it is killed because it's jumping in the wrong direction or in a hole or something like that. But then over time, it figures out that it needs to jump over the holes in order to reach the end of the level. And um, so this is a demo. We also have um, all the videos online for all the levels. We can uh, solve almost all of the levels except I think two. For some of the levels, we also find speed runs that basically use glitches uh, in the game engine such that we are faster. And um, as I said, without encoding any kind of input so it's not specific to the game. But also keep in mind, this only works because the game is de de uh, deterministic. So if the enemies would spawn at random places, this would not work. But here it works because they uh, deterministically spawn exactly at the same time, at the same space. And what we basically generate is an optimal sequence or at least a near optimal input sequence to bring Mario from the beginning of the level to the end. And yeah, if you want to see uh, movies of the other levels, uh, take a look at GitHub, then we have uploaded uh, all of them. And then as the last part of today's talk, um, I want to talk about another usenings paper we published in 2019, because yeah, in this typical game in security between offense and defense, we also um, did an, a more defensive paper uh, called Antifas where the main uh, intuition is that um, we wanted to explore what are the limitations of current fuzzing techniques. Because as I said earlier, fuzzing is very effective in uh, practice. OSS fuzz found more than 20,000 crashes in open source uh, programs. So this seems to be very efficient in practice. But still, uh, many of the things or many of the crashes we find are memory corruption vulnerabilities, or other things that are easy to detect because the program crashes. So what are actually the hard challenges? What are ways that current fuzzers cannot really overcome? Or how can we build a protection mechanism to protect a binary executable against fuzzing efforts? So the use case uh, we have here, uh, it's similar like a DRM mechanism. So you can think of this, you are, you are a software company, you perform your software engineering internally. So you develop your program, you do the testing internally to find vulnerabilities early on. And then at some point you decide that you want to ship your program to the customer. 
So you ship a binary executable to the customer, but you do not want that other, other external people uh, try to find vulnerabilities in an efficient way. And so what we do is we harden the binary against uh, automated fuzzing, such that we basically add a few mechanisms during the compilation phase, such that the resulting binary is hardened against automated software testing, such that when you ship something that an attacker cannot easily take this binary, use um, a stock fuzzer and find vulnerabilities in your code. Internally, of course, you have access to the source code, you can compile it differently, perform all the testing that you want, but only the binary that you're shipping is hardened. And as part of this, uh, we also uh, analyzed about 20 existing fuzzing frameworks and found that they rely on several and only uh, four basic assumptions. And what we do um, as part of this defense is we um, edit some um, mechanisms to uh, disturb those basic assumptions. Basically, we found that um, they, for example, rely on some like symbolic execution or an efficient way to detect crashes. And therefore, in this hardening step, we add some mechanisms to the binary uh, during the compilation phase to, uh, uh, to make uh, symbolic execution or crash detection harder in the sense that uh, yeah, we remove some of the basic assumptions that the fuzzers have. And yeah, as I said, the resulting binary is then hardened and it cannot be efficiently tested anymore. As a side effect, um, Antifuzz also shows um, the, um, the limitations of current fuzzers. So uh, this can also serve as a good starting point to think about other ways how to efficiently test programs. And uh, we are also exploring how some of these um, shortcomings that we identified could be bypassed in future generations of puzzles. And with this, I would like to briefly conclude uh, some of the challenges or outlooks I see. Um, fuzzing deeper in the software or hardware stack could be interesting. So we uh, already can test user land applications we can test operating system kernels, hypervisors, but then if you go down deeper in the stack, there are many other types of interesting uh, components. There's, for example, the management engine, there are SMM or SMI handlers, there are model-specific registers where not everything is documented. Um, the instruction set architecture might contain some kind of undocumented functionality. Um, some groups are doing very interesting types of reverse engineering there. Um, the question is whether we can also build efficient testing mechanisms deep in the software stack or maybe even at the hardware level. So there was a, a talk at Black Hat in 2017 that showed how this can be done at the CPU level. Um, on the other hand, you can also go higher in uh, things like um, compilers or especially just-in-time compilers that are challenging to test and practice. So um, there are many different types of system, systems that you can analyze and basically use all these frameworks or the algorithms that have been developed in the recent past to apply them yeah, in different la layers of the, of the software or hardware stack. Then a question that um, I always ask my students or that we discuss quite often is, if we execute a program, let's say 10 million times, and then we have another program that we execute 50 million times, and then we have a third program, can we then somehow use the information that we have uh, obtained in the past 60 million executions to have more clever ways how to do our mutations? So can we somehow reuse all the knowledge that we have collected by millions or maybe even billions of executions for the next target. Because at the moment we are starting from scratch. So each new target means we basically start with just zero bytes or maybe even some more clever seeds. But can we somehow use ML or some other statistic analysis techniques to um, help us to guide the fuzzing process more efficiently? One idea that we explored a bit so far was uh, the idea of ensemble fuzzing. So that's uh, similar like you uh, use in ensemble learning. So we have several weak classifiers, 
combine them and then you get a, a better classifier. So can we also combine several different fuzzing uh, tools, use their uh, strengths, combine them to obtain a, a meta fuzzer that is then uh, outperforming the base fuzzers. The initial results look a bit promising, but there's no really breakthrough yet. So it seems like we haven't found a clever way how to perform ensemble fuzzing such that we have a clear, um, clear performance uh, gain at the end. So still, this is, I think, an area worth exploring. And then um, similar like other areas, I think a better hardware and software support is needed. So a better co-design that basically the uh, processor somehow supports the testing efforts. So can we, for example, the bitmap, could this be tracked internally in the processor? Just then everything would be way more efficient. Or uh, there was very interesting work by Brendan Falk on vectorized emulation, where he uses MMX registers to basically in parallel run, run many different instances of a VM and then systematically explore the whole space much more efficiently. So millions of executions per second. So can we use all the advantages that basically our modern processors have many types of caches, can do many things uh, in parallel via cores and everything. They have interesting instruction set architecture extensions. So can we use all this new computing things because our CPUs and our operating systems are not the 70s anymore where we have just one single program running on a single CPU. How can we use all the power of modern CPUs to make testing you know, orders of magnitude more efficient? If you have ideas, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, my contact details are here. Uh, you can ping me via uh, email or Twitter, although Twitter is I'm not good at following Twitter, unfortunately, but uh, just reach out and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you for the presentation. Um, let's see if there are any questions. Um, maybe I, I can start. Mm -hmm. um, First of all, thanks for the very nice and uh, instructive uh, uh, talk. So I was wondering, uh, um, to what extent are your, do your techniques uh, um, or the techniques that you presented in general, let's say, generalize to more complex properties than uh, crashes? So like, um, you know, yep. maybe certain types of functional properties or certain types of security properties. Uh, that's actually a very good question. And the short answer is uh, we are good at detecting crashes, but not good at detecting higher level properties or other kinds of properties. So things like logical vulnerability or things like a, an unauthorized state transition is something that we cannot easily capture with um, the techniques I discussed today. Um, the typical approach that you can use is differential testing. So basically you have two implementations and then compare the outputs. Then you can also uh, get other kinds of properties. But many others, especially AFL-based ones, are only good at finding memory corruptions, typically crashes. In that space, they are very good. But then things like, like Heartbleed or something like that is something you cannot really find with um, existing methods. And therefore, I think that's also an interesting area to explore. So what kind of other properties, especially now with um, states, so stateful fuzzing or stateful testing can you uh, find by using all these techniques and basically do thing, doing this in a um, more efficient way. Thanks. Do we have some more questions? I would have one question. So first, thanks for the very interesting talk. And I would be interested in how long do you typically fuzz a program? So is there a point where you say, I fuzz it enough, now I stop? Or do you just continue until you run out of resources? Or? Yeah, that's actually also a very good question. Um, so for the papers that we do there, we typically do 24 hour runs and then do this 10 times and uh, basically have a yeah, statistical anal analysis of the results. 
Um, so these are the typical uh, plots that you basically see on the x-axis here of the time, on the y-axis, things like either um, edges taken or basic blocks executed or the number of bugs found, so basically a metric that basically improves over time. Um, what you see is typically that um, in the first uh, few minutes, first uh, maybe one or two hours, you have a steep increase. But then over time, the increase is getting uh, smaller. And then at some point, you're, it looks like you're flatlining. So the fuzzer doesn't really find something interesting. Um, when you let the program run longer, you will see that uh, there are, and this is then a bit of a random effect, that at some point, you, your fuzzer will unlock a specific condition. So basically, it has tried a few thousand times to generate an input, but every time a specific condition doesn't hold. But then just by chance, it will generate an interesting input. Then you are unlocking a specific condition, and then suddenly you have much more um, code areas that you can then explore. So you see a specific jumps that then happen over time. And there was recently, um, I see two interesting, or one or two interesting papers by Marcel Böhme and his group that explored this in more detail. And it turns out that uh, adding resources only helps you to a certain extent, because over time it gets uh, much more complicated to find interesting inputs. And therefore, um, a good understanding of how long you need to test your program is still missing. So in the software engineering community, some people are looking into this. Um, and in practice, so what the practitioners tell us or tell me uh, is, what they typically do is when they start, let's say a pen test, they first uh, use um, AFL or some kind of stock uh, fuzzer or AFL++, let it run, and then, then they do a, a manual analysis and then build custom fuzzers that are then custom for the target. And with them, they typically achieve also better coverage, but still AFL finds all the low hanging fruits within a few hours or a few days. Great, thanks. Hey, thanks. Um, do we have more questions? Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, hi. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I uh, would be interested in the following. Um, in property-based testing, uh, you sometimes have like this uh, very useful feature that uh, the, the testing engine is able to minimize the example. Uh, and like, and there, therefore, I wanted to ask that uh, like. Uh, do you do uh, any, any research to minimize the examples or to explain even the, uh, the examples to like the, the user? Because like just this input makes the program crash is maybe still uh, from there is maybe still a long way to, to get uh, uh, to, to understand why something happens. Yes. Yeah, and then, uh, that's also a good point. Um, so in my group, we have not explored this in detail, but there are other uh, papers in the fuzzing space. Uh, and AFL also has a tool that basically tries to minimize the test case. Mm -hmm. So um, there are, there are actually the existing tooling is not bad in the sense that um, they can generate a minimum test case in a small amount of time. So once you have a crashing input, then this input can, yeah, can be minimized. Uh, but then actually understanding why this leads to a crash is something that has not been explored that much. Um, but that's uh, actually an interesting area. So uh, we had um, also one paper last year at Usenix uh, called Aurora, um, where the idea was that we wanted to figure out what's actually the root cause behind an attack. Uh, sorry, behind a crash. So basically, the fuzzer is very um, efficient at finding crashes. We can, uh, if we have a target, let it run for, let's say, a day. We can, let's say, 10 or 20, maybe even 50 crashes. But then, of course, the next step is what's actually behind these crashes. There we uh, have um, a set of or a few uh, great student helpers that have actually quite an amazing experience in analyzing um, programs for the root cause. But of course, this doesn't scale. So I can pay the student helpers, but this doesn't really help because we need better tooling to do this. So uh, what we did then with Aurora is to try to determine in an automated way um, what the root cause behind a crash is, and then also to do, uh, perform some kind of binning. 
because if you have, let's say, 50 crashes, um, it turns out that, let's say, 10 of them actually lead to different crashes, but they trigger the same root cause. Only um, the side effects led to a different type of crash. And therefore, a better tooling to understand the root cause is, I think, needed. And then also bring this into an IDE such so that also a developer has um, or can understand what happened. Or then, of course, um, can we also generate patches in an automated way such that we can, in an ideal world, we have a binary, we test it, find a crash, identify the root cause, patch it, and then we can continue testing with the patch binary. And then we can also reach parts deeper in the code such that over time, we find vulnerabilities, fix them, and then we can test the hardened program and continue. And then hopefully this helps us to get more uh, robust software systems over time. Thanks. Welcome. Mm -hmm. hey, thank you. Um, I don't know if there are more questions from the audience. Maybe in the meantime, um, one question is um, if, students starting their studies um, listen to this talk what are the basic um, courses uh, that you would recommend that someone takes uh, to be able to do research or join your group or, or work with other groups that, that work in this area so what of the basic computer science um, classes that you would see in a typical bachelor or master program um, are the foundation on, on which you build mm -hmm. Um, I think on the one hand, um, you need to have a, yeah, a good system understanding. So basically, uh, you need to know how an operating system works, how you can build system level code. Um, so programming experience definitely helps. And then also uh, understanding assembler code or basically the low level details. So not only a high level language, but also the low level uh, things because um, many of the things cover the full stack, basically ranging from assembler, but also to the algorithmic level that you understand how to efficiently implement things. So it's actually quite a lot of systems building that we do. And therefore probably um, yeah, you need quite a few courses to understand and to, to get a bigger picture um, because yeah, it's, so the tools are typically a bit more complex but uh, you also need to be interested in software security. So how do memory corruption vulnerabilities work? What's return oriented programming and other techniques? And then for the tooling, um, actually AFL++ is a great project where a group of people started to um, take AFL. So basically this, um, this program that started a lot of work in this area. And then they are also re-implementing many uh, academic papers so they are exploring what actually works good in practice. And then they are integrating this into AFL++. And the AFL++ is a complete toolbox where you can basically also quickly exchange specific parts of it. So let's say you want to explore new mutation strategies or you want to explore other ways how an instrumentation can be performed or you want to explore another architecture can be supported. They, are, they have a great design um, they had a talk at uh, CCC Congress last year where they provided a broad overview of the different components. And if you want to get started in this area, uh, check out AFL++ or, of course, our tools because they also work well. <laughs> um, great. Thanks. Thanks again for the uh, great presentation and uh, for the questions um, we had. And we hope to sometime see you in person in Vienna. But you would welcome if you yeah. uh, come would for be, a research stay. Would be great to come to Vienna <laughs> soon. If you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank Look, you. Looking forward to having you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye.